pandemics. From the Black Death of the 14th century, to the Spanish flu of 1918, to the SARS epidemic of the 21st century, outbreaks of virulent diseases have devastated entire societies. Many civilizations came close to being destroyed by the importation of Western diseases. Now, health officials fear we may be on the verge of another epidemic. We don't know when it's coming. It may be pandemic influenza, it may be something else. And one scientist believes that the culprit may come from outer space. There's no question that a comet bone pandemic would occur at some point in the future. And we may have no defense against these extraterrestrial diseases. That's probably the doomsday scenario that we should worry about most. The result could be catastrophic. A tragedy of unimaginable proportions. Alien infection on mega disasters. Microscopic germs hidden from the naked eye. Throughout history, these mysterious invaders have wreaked havoc on mankind with devastating outbreaks of disease. The best minds of science have searched for the origins of these epidemics. Now, a respected astrobiologist suggests that some of the worst pandemics may have come from outer space. I think every new epidemic disease had come from space originally at one point in time. If this controversial theory is correct, it could help solve the mystery of the origins of some of the deadliest epidemics in history. For thousands of years, people had no idea what caused diseases and how they were spread. Then, in the mid-19th century, scientists discovered that some diseases were caused by microbes called bacteria. Fifty years later, scientists discovered even smaller disease-causing agents called viruses. It wasn't until the 1920s, 30s, or 40s that we had devices like electron microscopes that would allow us to see these very tiny viruses, visualize them, and figure out a little bit about them. Although the origins of some diseases have remained a mystery, science has been able to answer many of the questions about how germs are transmitted. Throughout history, diseases were often spread by travelers. As long as people have been traveling, so too have the germs that reside in those beings. For thousands of years, geographic barriers such as oceans, deserts, and mountains provided some protection. But these natural defenses were broken when technological innovations enabled humans to travel the planet. In 1492, Christopher Columbus became one of the first to breach this barrier when he sailed from Spain to what we now call the Bahamas. When Columbus returned to Europe, his king and queen celebrated his triumph. What no one realized was that he and his crew had brought back a deadly microbe. The bacteria they carried was called syphilis, an infection that is transmitted through sexual contact and attacks the nervous system and destroys the brain. For the next five centuries, syphilis ravaged Europe. Invariably, germs have proven to be more virulent when first introduced to a new population. Doctors of infectious disease call the phenomenon viral naivety. These particular communities had never had any experience with that bacteria or virus. And so they had a much greater immunological response, and it was much more devastating than if they had built up some antibodies, some immune response to those germs. In many cases, once a person has had a disease and survived, he will not be infected again. The human body's immune system remembers the foreign invaders who try to attack it. And sometimes its immune response is brilliant. In 1519, the conquistadors carried a contagious disease called smallpox to Mexico. Contagious literally meant it was by touch. So smallpox is a contagious disease because if you have an open sore and then you touch somebody else with that open sore, they'll likely, they have a high likelihood of contracting that disease. 
it was smallpox more than the Spaniard's swords that devastated the native population. 200 years later, Captain James Cook crossed the South Pacific and left a trail of death in his wake. These were people that had been living in island situations where they were cut off from contact with the outside world. Many of these civilizations came close to being destroyed by the importation of Western diseases. By the 19th century, Americans living in port cities feared the waves of immigrants coming into their midst. Ships from Eastern Europe often arrived with many of their passengers already dead. East European Jewish immigrants were called socially undesirable immigrants, as were Southern Italians and Chinese and Balkan immigrants and many others. In 1892, President Benjamin Harrison halted all immigration when back-to-back -back epidemics of cholera and typhus caused a panic. Typhus fever is called a filth disease because it's associated with filthy living conditions. It's actually born by lice. And when they bite a human being, the human being gets typhus fever, which is marked by terrible fevers. You're, you're quite insane, the fever is so high. And a body rash and seizures, and ultimately for about 25 to 35% of those who get it, death. In 1918, the world was in the midst of a war on a scale never before seen. Out of the carnage rose a deadly virus. You cannot separate World War I from the 1918 pandemic. They are intimate partners. It should be remembered that this was the most fatal epidemic in all of human history. People called the 1918 influenza the Spanish lady, believing it had started in Spain. But even today, no one knows where the pandemic originated. And a day before air travel, this appeared almost every place in the world simultaneously. We now know that this global pandemic may have killed up to 100 million people. Witnesses describe the course of the illness as shocking. Victims' lungs hemorrhaged, filling with blood. In many cases, death occurred in a matter of hours. Authorities were soon forced to quarantine the victims. There were closure of uh, sporting events, of uh, films, of vaudeville, theater, saloons, where people congregated. And when you think about a disease like influenza, that is primarily transmitted by the spread of respiratory droplets or aeros aerosolized respiratory particles, so coughing, sneezing, things like that. The idea of separating the sick from the healthy actually makes a bit of sense. So many Americans died that bodies were stacked in the streets like cords of wood. In some towns, people buried corpses in mass graves. But no one knew what had caused the epidemic. Today, many experts fear another global pandemic. Some even suggest that the next devastating scourge may come from outer space. Science has made enormous progress in understanding the transmission of germs. And yet, the best minds have been unable to answer one basic question. Where do diseases originate? In answer to this question, Chandra Wickram Singha, the director of the Cardiff Center for Astrobiology, has advanced a controversial new theory. He believes that some of mankind's deadliest pandemics have emanated not from Earth, but from outer space. Chandra's work began over three decades ago in conjunction with the late astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle. They investigated the possibility that life is not confined to Earth. Life is indeed a truly cosmic phenomenon, that it's not an Earth-bound uh, thing, that we are part of a connected chain of being that goes through the comets to the remotest parts of our universe. This theory is known as panspermia, the hypothesis that life on Earth originated elsewhere in the universe. There has to be a, an enormous range in the types of microorganisms that are around in the cosmos. We have interacted 
and we have in fact evolved from a subset of these microorganisms, we have to conclude that our genetic ancestors still lurk amongst the stars. Chandra believes that the seeds of life were transported to Earth by comets four billion years ago. We know that this was a time of intense comet bombardment. Both the Earth and the Moon were being pounded by comet impacts. And I think it is quite remarkable that the oldest evidence of life on the Earth coincides with this epoch of intense bombardment, suggesting very strongly that comets did bring the, the first life onto the Earth. Comets are formed from material contained in the gigantic dust clouds of interstellar space. There are about 100 billion such objects, each measuring about 10 kilometers across, surrounding the entire planetary system, entire solar system, at a distance of about one third of a light year. In 2006, NASA's Stardust mission successfully collected comet dust, bringing astrobiologists one step closer to understanding what these comets are made of. Comet dust contains uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, which are uh, building blocks uh, of, of life. Few in the scientific establishment had expected comets to contain any organic material whatsoever. This preconception had influenced the kinds of experiments that were undertaken by the Stardust mission. There was no question at the time of planning the Stardust mission to look for evidence of life, of microscopic living uh, forms in the cometary dust. So the manner in which the stardust particles were collected essentially precludes the survival of any living particles. In 2001, Chandra, in collaboration with the Indian Space Research Organization, launched a balloon into the upper stratosphere, 28 miles above the Earth, to collect samples of comet dust. We found evidence of bacterial type cells, clumps of them in fact. So there was evidence that the particles in the upper stratosphere, which we argue came from comets, have uh, signs of life. For Chandra, this was vindication of the theory of panspermia and the basis for a new explanation for the origin of some diseases. Once you accept that life did not start here on the Earth, that it came from comets, then you've got to take seriously the possibility that even diseases and epidemics may be caused by the introduction of cometary microorganisms. Chandra believes that some viruses could survive even the harshest conditions in space. The notion that disease-causing organisms come from space may explain the odd patterns of certain historical epidemics, including the influenza of 1918. It's very different from any other influenza virus that's ever been seen in fundamental ways. Uh, almost everything about it was a mystery. It appeared to come out of nowhere, um, and there was no precedent for it. The first anomaly of the 1918 epidemic was that it simultaneously struck on distant continents. The lethal wave of the 1918 pandemic started on the same day in Boston and Bombay, and this was way before air travel. This wide dispersal of the virus undermines the possibility of person-to-person -person transmission. Although infectious diseases like influenza follow a rapid trajectory, this was too fast. The second mystery of the 1918 flu was the pattern of death among people within a specific age range. Why was it so fatal, disproportionately fatal, to healthy young adults who almost never are at high risk of dying from flu? The explanation given by epidemiologists is that during the war years, many young men fought together in the trenches or were sequestered in army bases. Crowded barracks were the perfect breeding ground for the virus. 
But Chandra speculates that the vulnerability of people in their 20s and 30s was caused by an entirely different factor. Since this age group was more active and more likely to move about in the open air, they were more likely to be exposed to the airborne virus. We've got to understand why it spread so rapidly in 1918, and the clear answer is that it fell from the skies. Population density seemed to have no bearing on the way the disease moved across the wide open spaces of Alaska. In 1918, fewer than 50,000 people lived in Alaska, an area the size of Europe. The influenza spread like wildfire instantly across the whole, that whole area uh, once it got started. In some Eskimo villages, up to 90% of the population died. Doctors of infectious disease say this is a perfect example of viral naivety, in which a population without immunity is more vulnerable to a disease. Still, this does not explain how the epidemic jumped from one isolated village to another. They had to use the most tedious ways to go from one end of Alaska to another. And the person-to-person -person contact is just impossible in those situations. Since the virus vanished in the spring of 1919, it has remained a mystery. A mystery that has lured several scientists to search for answers preserved in ice. Fearing a similar pandemic could strike soon, experts are in a race against time. If they unlock the virus's genetic code, they could save millions of lives. Could the influenza epidemic of 1918 have originated in outer space? The flu of 1918 was like no influenza ever seen before. Like a biblical plague, it ravaged the world. In the US, influenza appeared in September, and within three months, half a million Americans lay dead. Doctors were desperate to know where it came from and how it was transmitted. Most important, could it happen again? Decades later, scientists had not unlocked any of its secrets. Then, in 1951, a pathologist named Johann Halton set out to solve this mystery. Knowing that heat is the enemy of viruses, Halton reasoned that if the flu were to be preserved anywhere, it would be in the ice of the Great White North. His idea was to retrieve lung tissue from long dead flu victims buried in the permafrost. But the thought was because viruses can be preserved in low temperature freezers and other, so other cold sources uh, for long periods of time, that if these people had died with virus in them, um, that virus might be frozen and preserved in the way it would be in a freezer and then recoverable. Hulton learned that 72 of the 80 residents living in the village of Brevig had died from the flu during the month of November 1918. There were small villages in Alaska where the rate of death was very high, and nobody really knows why. He exhumed several corpses from a mass gravesite sunk deep in the frozen tundra. Hulton tried to culture the virus, but he never succeeded. The technology at the time was limited. 44 years later, in 1995, a molecular pathologist named Dr. Jeffrey Taubenberger decided to try again. If he could sequence the virus, he might be able to make a protective vaccine. This time, Taubenberger had at his disposal a revolutionary new technique called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction. And it's a fancy scientific word for a technique in which small amounts of nucleic acid, which can't otherwise be detected, can be amplified so that instead of being uh, X number of copies, there are 10X and 100X and 1,000X and a million X copies. When the nucleic acid is replicated, it goes from being undetectable to detectable. Once it's detectable, the sequence can be determined. Using PCR, Taubenberger analyzed lung tissue that had been fixed in formalin and stored in the tissue repository of the Armed Services Institute of Pathology. The shattered genes of the virus were so fragile, it took 10 years to sequence its RNA. 
Taubenberger was able to confirm that the 1918 flu virus had originated with birds. That's not a surprise because we've never seen a human influenza virus that hasn't ultimately come from birds. But the mystery deepened. It's not like uh, any bird virus we've ever seen before. The 1918 flu seems to have caused what doctors refer to as an immunological storm. And what looks to have happened in these young men and women is that their immune system was on such overdrive that it flooded their lungs with fluid, chemicals, chemotaxins, macrophages, various components of the immune system, and it did too, too good of a job. It actually caused more damage than perhaps the virus itself. Just as alarming, once the flu jumped species, it mutated, making it easy to transmit from person to person. It is this characteristic that sends shivers down the spines of epidemiologists. If a virus or another flu virus were to learn those kind of tricks, and we had a pandemic of, an, of a very highly fatal virus, that's probably the doomsday scenario that we should worry about most. No one knows how dangerous the next flu strain will be. But one scientist believes that the next pandemic is already lurking in the frozen material of space. Just as the 1918 flu was preserved in the ice of the Alaskan tundra, so too might alien viruses be preserved in the ice of comets. Once they are deep frozen in a small particle of ice or material of any kind, uh, they could last for an eternity. Chandra believes there could be a pattern to the way comets deliver germs to Earth. I think the most likely scenario is that for a comet to deposit in the stratosphere a pathogenic microorganism, a pathogenic virus, and for that virus to cause the, the new pandemic. Chandra theorizes the SARS epidemic of 2003 is one such example. Experts now know SARS was caused by a virus that usually infects the respiratory or gastrointestinal tracts of mammals or birds and was first identified in China. We think it came from the ingestion of a civet, which is a cat-like creature. It's a great delicacy in, in Chinese culture. And uh, as those people traveled to other parts of China, they potentially infected those people. This was no surprise to epidemiologists. Asia is the epicenter of many viruses. The conventional reasoning behind this is that in Asia, people live in closer proximity to poultry and waterfowl. But Chandra has another more controversial theory. The first points of descent of a virus that is injected into the upper stratosphere turn, has to be um, eastwards of the Himalayas, because that is the highest mountain range on the planet that almost pokes a hole in the stratosphere. And small particles, virus-sized particles, introduced into the Earth's uh, environment slightly eastward of the Himalayas. If germs are dropping from space, it follows that birds would be the first recipients of a flu virus. They sample the atmosphere more extensively than any other creature on our planet. They fly across hundreds of thousands of miles and they inhale and exhale the virus. But most astrobiologists stress that this is an unproven theory. Well, there is no direct evidence that cometary dust has been responsible for epidemics on the Earth. However, the genome revolution has positioned scientists to either prove or disprove the notion that comet dust is full of pathogens. But we do have samples of a comet now just brought back by the Stardust mission, and so there's a way to test this idea that there are organisms on comets. Coincidentally, the same technique used to sequence the 1918 flu, PCR or polymerase chain reaction, could be used to detect any microbial life present in comet dust. Every time you sort of heat and cool a sample, you can double the amount of DNA in it. And that is the method of choice for prospecting for microbes on Earth. In fact, PCR is such a sensitive life detector, scientists have used it to discover microorganisms in places where no one ever dreamed of finding life. Habitats like boiling hot springs or frozen wastelands in Antarctica 
or acid runoff at, with pHs of one, even organisms that can live in high doses of radiation, bacteria that can live on nuclear fuel rods in cooling ponds. Astrobiologists are interested in hunting for microbes in space, where conditions are even more extreme. Obviously, space is a challenging environment to live. There's no liquid water, it's a vacuum, there are no nutrients or few nutrients. In the quest to discover extraterrestrial life, plans are in the works to construct a remote PCR test that can be performed on samples taken from the surface of Mars. We are trying to build a DNA detector to send to Mars, and it's very much based on what we know about life on Earth. In this case, the spacecraft and the samples would remain on Mars. Using PCR analysis, geneticists will attempt to find alien microbes by testing for the universal genes that define life as we know it here on Earth. To date, they have identified 500 of these core genes. You can ask, of those 500 genes, what's the one or two genes that, are, that have changed the least? These are the genes that you can use as hooks to look for other organisms. It's possible that some of these alien microorganisms we may find may be pathogenic. Without thorough testing, we will never know. Some experts believe that it makes more sense to test for Martian life by bringing samples back to a laboratory here on Earth. We'll be looking for indications of active life. We would look for fossils. We would look for spores or dormant states. We'll even look for biomaterials, remnants of cell walls or whatever. So we'll look for any and all things that might be associated with life. However, the mission would not be without risks. And the only hazard of real concern to us in terms of the globe is a replicating organism of some sort. Experts agree the chances are remote that Martian germs could escape and devastate the planet. NASA has put safeguards in place to quarantine a real-life Andromeda strain. But will they be sufficient? If an alien infection from outer space were to strike Earth, health officials might look to the lessons of the past for help. History has taught us that epidemics have a life of their own. The challenge today is how to detect and isolate disease-causing agents before they spread. Each disease has its own timetable, its own tempo, its own mode of infection, its own serial interval, uh, its own infectivity, and all that is taken into account by, by public health officials. The first step taken by doctors when a new disease is suspected is to understand how it is transmitted. Is it transmitted in the food or water? Is it transmitted by coughing on people? Is it transmitted by sexual activity? Because if you understand that transmission, you could potentially block it. Public health officials know that once a disease spreads beyond control, panic may set in, and friends turn against friends. Family members may shun their own kin. This was true during the polio epidemic of the 1930s and 40s. It was not unusual for small towns to close themselves off from the outside world. Public gathering places like schools, swimming pools, and amusement parks were shut down. And we may face another global flu pandemic within our lifetime. We need to be prepared for the next threat, and we don't know when it's coming. It may be pandemic influenza, it may be something else. In a time of crisis, doctors fully expect that many hospitals will reach surge capacity. Doctors and nurses will fall sick. You could lose 30% of your healthcare workers so that your capacity in and of itself to take care of an incremental number has already shrunk. Life-saving equipment will run out. We would have to perhaps tap into what's called a strategic national stockpile of antiviral agents or even ventilators to support people. As we saw with Hurricane Katrina, alternative care centers may be opened. In the kind of pandemic that we're envisioning, we'd actually like to keep people away from the hospital. The hospital is a wonderful place to spread disease. Experts say planning ahead is crucial. You are not going to be thinking too clearly in the midst of a major crisis. 
and key people themselves may be very sick. And so you don't want to be making deep moral decisions without a context to make them. You'll be way too emotional at the time. In order to staunch the spread of a possible epidemic, guidelines have been established in advance. Doctors are required to report any unusual spikes in infectious diseases to health authorities. If there is cause for alarm, health authorities will impose a partial quarantine. That would be a series of actions whereby public gatherings would not occur, concerts would be uh, canceled, for example, schools would close. In recent years, cases of a bird flu called H5N1 have greatly alarmed epidemiologists. The fatality rate among those infected is staggering. The H5N1 virus in Asia and other places which has been killing over 50% of people. They know this flu has jumped from birds to humans. In a few isolated cases, it may have been transmitted from one person to another. If this possibility increases our anxiety, what about an alien infection brought here by a returning spacecraft? The stuff of science fiction, perhaps, but experts treat the possibility very seriously. The notion that it is dangerous to move material from one planet to another has been a concern of many scientists involved with space exploration. Article 9 of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty signed by more than 90 nations, dictates that all countries will avoid harmful contamination of the Earth. When we sent astronauts to the moon during the Apollo program, the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty were put to their first test. At the time the astronauts came back, they were quarantined, along with the rocks and samples that they brought back. NASA continues to be concerned that a returning space probe could bring back an alien organism that would infect our biosphere. What's the probability that that sample might have something in it that could be infectious or biohazardous to humans? It's very low, but not zero. In the search for extraterrestrial life, NASA scientists have long considered the planet Mars the best nearby candidate. During the late 70s, after the Viking probe to Mars seemed to indicate there was no life on the red planet, the concern over bringing organisms back to Earth faded. However, some startling new discoveries have caused astrobiologists to question that verdict. In 2006, photos taken of the surface of Mars by the global surveyor showed the presence of newly formed gullies not apparent only six years earlier. These formations indicate that liquid water could have flowed on Mars within the last decade. This discovery has increased the likelihood that there may be life on Mars. On Earth, everywhere that we see water, we see life. So if one is trying to find life as we know how to recognize it, the best place to look is where the water is. Now, after more than 30 years, NASA may be gearing up to launch a new mission to look for existing life on Mars. The real important thing for science would be to bring back samples so we could throw a whole battery of tests and lots of scientific expertise at the debate and actually have the samples here on Earth. In this case, a spacecraft will be sent to Mars to collect soil samples. How the device would collect samples up there how samples would be sealed up in something that is locked tight and could come all the way back to Earth without releasing its containment. That's something that has to be worked on. The sample would consist of material scooped from the surface of Mars. It would fit maybe in a coffee cup. It would be made up of some gas, gases that were in collected at the same time, dusts, small soil samples, as well as pebbles, little um, stones that have been drilled out. This container may hold the first evidence of extraterrestrial life, a prospect that sets off alarm bells. Some fear it could contain microbes as dangerous to the human population as those that caused the 1918 flu. If you move organisms from one place to another place, beyond where they would normally disperse, you can have surprising outcomes when the new populations interact with each other. NASA's policy is to treat any sample as hazardous until proven otherwise. In the quest to return a Mars sample to Earth, 
NASA has anticipated just about everything that might go wrong. Space flight is, uh, is a risky business. Probably the biggest uh, threat would be that it crashed and was um, uh, exposed to the environment. It looks like we have a no-shoot, sir. Vector 200. An accident is a very real possibility, as evidenced from the crash of the Genesis capsule in 2004. NASA engineers will safeguard against this possibility by building a craft that is designed to handle a hard landing. Even if the capsule crashes, the container that holds the Mars sample will remain intact. The capsule will be picked up at that point and transported to a quarantine module and then to a receiving lab. This facility would meet biosafety level four containment standards. Biosafety level four is the maximum containment used by Center of Disease Control and others when handling the most virulent organisms on Earth. Not because we think that a virulent organism would be in the sample, but because we don't know. And in that uncertainty, we want to take the conservative route, which means to treat it the strictest way you can until you know more. But we're at that point in history where, like Columbus, we have the technology. We are looking to a new world. It's off our planet. And we have lots of ideas, but they're backed up by science. And it just really opens the whole idea of life in this universe into a new dimension. NASA has taken precautions to prevent alien organisms from reaching Earth on a returning space probe. But what if an alien infection should reach the Earth by another route? Some infectious disease experts subscribe to the theory that the 1918 flu epidemic came from outer space. If it is true, it could happen again. One day in the future, a real-life Andromeda strain could come to Earth. A global pandemic brought by a comet. I think it's inevitable. There's no question that uh, a comet bone pandemic would occur at some point in the future. The comet passes within nine million miles of Earth and streaks by, depositing dust into our upper atmosphere. There is a stellar-like head from which there are a couple of tails, long tails, uh, streaming out. These long tails are essentially the evaporated material from the surface of the comet. The Earth's gravity pulls these particles to the surface. The dust begins falling toward Earth. Ordinarily, the Earth's gravity pulls the dust down slowly. It can take decades for the particles to reach the Earth's surface. But every 11 years, the sun enters what astronomers call a sunspot cycle. The sun is a very active star. On the surface, it is spewing out energetic particles, electrons, and magnetic fields are present in large quantity. During a peak in sunspot activity, Huge quantities of energetic particles are ejected from the sun's surface. The charged particles lead to the production of very uh, strong electric fields. The electric field effect pulls the virus down to Earth very quickly, providing the final ingredient for a pandemic. You seem to need the peak of sunspots plus the, the virus injection to trigger a flu pandemic. Migrating birds inhale the dust, ingesting virus particles contained within the dust. An avian reservoir of virus is very easily established uh, from an external source. The birds now carry a lethal virus in their digestive tracts. A few mutations, and the virus jumps species. The virus quickly spreads to cities across the globe. Among them, Washington, D.C. Several infected patients arrive in the emergency room of a local hospital. The waiting room is crowded, and they are forced to sit elbow to elbow with other patients. Someone sneezes. 85 million bacteria and 4,600 invisible viral particles explode into the air, hurling at a muzzle velocity of 152 feet per second the particles travel up to a distance of 12 feet. 
they linger in the air for more than half an hour. During this time, each mucousy droplet spawns 19,000 colonies of bacteria. It's a biological mega disaster in the making. Several of the patients complain of extreme fatigue and heaviness in their chests. Doctors order diagnostic tests. It seems like an ordinary flu. Then, one young man coughs up a stream of blood. A nurse notices that his feet are turning blue from lack of oxygen. Somewhere along the way, there'll be a different pattern to the illness. The problem there is that by then, other people may have been infected. The hospital notifies public health officials. Doctors can't agree on a diagnosis. Many of these new emerging infections are easily missed. Uh, one, because we're not necessarily anticipating them, and two, they can masquerade like anything else. By now, over 100 people have been exposed. These people, in turn, expose others. In a nearby office building, a public health surveillance agent watches a bank of monitors. At a city level, an emergency department starts noticing a spike in the number of people with increased respiratory problems. By now, the hospital administrator has heard even more alarming news. At Dulles Airport, a passenger arriving from Hong Kong has been carried off the plane dead. His clothes are splattered with dried blood. Autopsy results are pending, but the suspected killer is a variation of the H5N1 virus. If a virus like the current so-called bird flu, the H5N1 virus in Asia, which has been killing over 50% of people, if that virus were to become pandemic, it would be a tragedy of, uh, of unimaginable proportions. In other cities all over the country, the same terrifying scenario is playing out. Public health authorities follow the guidelines prepared for a Category 5 pandemic. Households with ill people are quarantined. Many commercial flights are grounded. Work hours are staggered to slow the flow of public transportation. Daycare centers and schools are closed. Public access to Washington's monuments is denied. Well, unfortunately, uh, pandemic influenza can disrupt all aspects of society in, in, a, in a very fundamental way. And projections are that in a worst case scenario, there may be absentee rates of 30 to 40 percent from all businesses. By now, patients are streaming into the local hospitals, which quickly fill to capacity. Something this large and of this scale, we along with other elements of the city and state hope that many of the patients, in fact, will be diverted away from hospitals. Doctors and nurses are falling sick. Emergency services are overwhelmed. Bottom line is really massive epidemic. We will run out of respirators, not just in this region, but in the country. Emergency room doctors do their best to evaluate patients. In a disaster framework, the overriding philosophy that is used to decide who gets the resources is the greatest good for the greatest number. Those who have the least likelihood of making it are denied precious resources. You have to make these Solomonic decisions, which uh, can be very, very hard. In these cases, death is unavoidable. In spite of media attempts to allay people's fear, panic mounts. Patients who do not need respirators are diverted to an open-air sports stadium. The Ravens uh, football stadium, lots of flat, open space inside where all the concessions are, very nice, very comfortable. There's good facilities, lots of bathrooms, lots of running water and so forth. The bigger issue is, is the transference of bodies and, and remains of, of people to the city, state, or regional morgues. Bodies are accumulating so quickly, the morgues are filled to capacity. At local cemeteries, freshly dug graves multiply, but cannot keep up with the death toll. Three weeks into the epidemic, Washington, D.C. is a ghost town, and Washington is not alone. Cities all over the country are grappling with what has become a biological catastrophe, affecting millions of lives. For now, this scenario is still fiction. 
But if it should happen, can science help us find a way to protect ourselves against this kind of epidemic? A respected scientist believes an oceanic catastrophe threatens Earth. A massive release of volatile methane gas. The damage will be of a scale which has not been observed ever. A methane eruption may have caused the greatest mass extinction in Earth's history. If it occurred in the past, it could strike once more in the future. There is no question in my mind that it will happen again. Tsunamis inundate coastal cities. And lightning ignites clouds of explosive gas. There will be huge fires, conflagrations, explosions. Methane explosion on mega disasters. It's often called the Big Blue Marble. Planet Earth sheathed in its cloak of life-giving water. But hidden at the bottom of its oceans, there could be a ticking time bomb. It is a vast reservoir of potentially dangerous methane gas. In the deep ocean, huge quantities of methane are held in solution with the liquid seawater or frozen in ice deposits trapped in sediment. Normally, when methane bubbles up from the seafloor, most of the bubbles gradually disappear because methane has the ability to dissolve into water. No different than salt or sugar, when it dissolves, it becomes invisible. Methane, the simplest of all hydrocarbons, is the main component of natural gas. It is both a resource and a hazard. Dissolved in water, it will not burn. But when it is released into the air, any spark can make it explode. This is what can happen when methane is ignited. The source of this 1994 explosion was an ordinary 36-inch natural gas pipeline in Durham Woods, New Jersey. It created a blowtorch of 1,500-degree flame, 600 feet high for two and a half hours, until utility workers were finally able to shut off the gas flow. As spectacular as this seems, the amount of gas that caused it is minuscule compared to the explosive potential from methane in the ocean. The total amount of natural gas, which is essentially methane, which was released in that fireball, is about three billion times less uh, than the amount which would be released in a reasonable size uh, oceanic eruption. Dr. Gregory Riskin is a professor of chemical engineering at Northwestern University. He has developed a controversial theory that says the oceans can and have produced methane eruptions on a global scale. It has happened periodically over the last half billion years without fail. So there is no question in my mind that it will happen again. Riskin believes that the worst methane eruption in Earth's history happened 250 million years ago at the end of a time geologists now call the Permian period. Methane, says Riskin, was responsible for the Permian mass extinction, the largest mass extinction of all time. What is a mass extinction? Some people say it's just when a lot of species go extinct suddenly, a lot. Uh, true, but that's not enough. Not only species, but groups of species, whole categories of species. In the Permian mass extinction, up to 95% of all species disappeared from the face of the Earth. Today, many scientists call it the Great Dying, and they continue to debate its cause. The terminal Permian extinction has bothered us paleontologists for 200 years. In the past, researchers have theorized that the extinction was caused by an ice age or climate change due to movement of the continents perhaps an asteroid strike. 
a nearby supernova in space, or widespread volcanic lava flows in Siberia. But Professor Riskin believes the extinction was the product of a giant methane eruption and its incredible explosive force. The amount of energy which would be released in the combustion and explosion of the methane in a large eruption would be about 10,000 times greater than the total nuclear stockpile which is available at this moment. Before the Permian extinction, the Earth was a very different looking planet than it is today. Most of the ever drifting continents were fused together in one giant landmass called Pangaea. Long before the dinosaurs, tiger sized fin back reptiles lived among the primitive trees, while crocodile like amphibians inhabited the swamps. An enormous planet wide ocean was populated by ancient fish, corals, and other sea creatures. Species that would disappear between the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic period. In the times of Permian Triassic boundary, the situation, the geographical situation, was especially conducive to the stagnant ocean. A stagnant basin in the lowest part of the ocean is one of the first ingredients in generating methane eruptions. Riskin's theory works like this. Deep pockets in the ocean allow methane to accumulate over long periods of time. Perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps even a million of years. Until eventually the water will be essentially saturated with dissolved methane. Methane itself comes from the seabed, where microbes dine on organic matter, producing methane as a byproduct. In most parts of the ocean, currents keep things moving, helping to provide oxygen for other microbes that consume methane, which keeps it from building up. Most of the deep ocean is sort of ventilated. In other words, uh, it's very sluggishly moving, but it is moving. But where there is no motion, the ocean is stagnant and the waters become anoxic, meaning they have little oxygen. So no methane-eating microbes can live there and the gas slowly dissolves into the deep waters. It's well known that deep water creates high pressure and the more water is under pressure, the more gas it can hold in solution. The pressure of the deep stagnant basins on ancient Earth may have set the stage for the methane eruption. The concentration, the actual amount of methane molecules in a given volume of water can be 200 times greater uh, near the seafloor than near the surface of the ocean. In the Permian period, a seafloor basin of methane-saturated water may have reached a breaking point. An earthquake, underwater landslide, or even a meteor impact could have been the trigger. And suddenly, like shaking a gigantic soda bottle, the deepest part of the ocean would have exploded in a deadly storm of methane bubbles. The threat to life began below the sea surface, where the methane bubbles pushed huge quantities of oxygen poor water upward. The effect was to suffocate marine animals on a wide scale. Then the churning methane gushed skyward, shooting huge fountains of gas-laden water into the air, a violent process that may have gone on for days or weeks. Methane is lighter than air and would normally float away, but in the chaos of an ocean eruption, the swirling clouds of gas and water stay low to the Earth's surface. The expelled the methane will be mixed with water droplets, and it's very important that it will be heavier than the air, so it will be hugging the Earth as it spreads. Now, this uh, explosive material is uh, going to be ignited by lightning, and then there will be huge fires, conflagrations, explosions. The shock of the ocean's eruptions also may have sent tsunamis crashing against Pangaea's coasts, drowning animals that lived on the shorelines. 
it would take the barren Earth five million years to regain the diversity of life it lost during the Great Dying. The mass extinction is an accepted fact, but the notion of a methane eruption as its cause is a radical idea with little acceptance in the scientific community. Much of the skepticism over Riskin's theory stems from the fact that no one has ever witnessed a methane eruption. Until recently, no one imagined that any kind of gas had the potential to generate such natural eruptions in water. But that changed in 1986, when a mountain lake in the African nation of Cameroon erupted in a deadly carbon dioxide gas explosion that was totally new to human experience. We don't think of lakes as just rearing up and killing massive amounts of people. And so this was a very rare phenomenon. The concept of gas exploding from bodies of water was suddenly plausible. If gas can create a killer lake, then why not methane in a killer ocean? The idea of a violent methane eruption from one of the world's oceans seemed like science fiction until something very much like it actually happened. It took place at Lake Nyos in the African nation of Cameroon. Well, in 1986 in Lake Nyos, uh, something happened in lakes that had never happened before. There was a tremendous eruption of CO2 gas that was stored in the lake. A huge fountain driven by 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide shot out from the waters of Lake Nyos. This gas, when it came out of the lake, produced so much energy that it generated a gas water fountain out of the lake that was about 100 meters high. And it filled up the lake basin, and because CO2 is about twice as heavy as air, it flowed out over the spillway and coursed down through the river valleys where it killed people up to 16 miles away from the lake. 1,700 local villagers and all their livestock died, smothered by carbon dioxide, which reached concentrations of nearly 100%. In the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is in a concentration of about 0.03%, so three hundredths of a percent. Now, for humans, concentrations aren't dangerous until they get to about 10 or 15%. And at that point, they produce an epiglottal stoppage, so your air pipe shuts down very quickly, and actually you die from suffocation quickly. History is filled with stories of volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. But no one had ever recorded anything like the gas explosion at Lake Nyos. Part of why it seemed impossible for this to happen, this kind of an eruption to happen in a lake, was that it hadn't happened before. At Lake Nyos, scientists discovered that far below the lake floor, a pocket of hot magma generates carbon dioxide gas that rises up into the lake bottom where it continually dissolves in the water. The gas is stored in the high pressure deep water. But if the pressure is ever released, the gas bubbles out, exactly the same principle as in a bottle of champagne. In any bottle with dissolved gas in it, like champagne, um, you don't see the gas because the pressure of the cap is forcing the gas into solution. However, when you take the pressure off of the gas, that is, you take the lid off here, then what happens is the gas is free to expand rapidly, and it produces this tremendous explosion. And you get the gas coming out of solution with a lot of expansion force. In Lake Nyos, the weight of the water acted like the champagne cork, and a sudden disturbance released it. Kling and others believe a landslide may have been the trigger, but it was the gas itself that created the threat. What happened at Lake Neos is that there were high concentrations of gas in the bottom water, CO2 that had built up over very long periods of time. And nobody really knew about it. We didn't know that it was so dangerous. Dangerous gas under pressure in deep water was a rare phenomenon. But could it exist elsewhere? 
Apart from Nyos, researchers found that gas is also accumulating in African lakes Monun and Kivu. The discovery led scientists to wonder whether this could happen again. The eruption at Lake Nyos re really lit a fuse in the scientific uh, community for an explosion of ideas about where else this might have occurred, and, and most specifically, whether there were these kinds of tremendous gas eruptions from the ocean. But this idea that similar methane deposits in the ocean can cause catastrophic eruptions is yet to be accepted by mainstream scientists. Now, at, the, at this moment, my theory is not uh, very popular, which is completely understandable because of its kind of radical nature. As a chemical engineer studying subjects normally in the realm of geologists and paleontologists, Professor Riskin faces a struggle for acceptance. The work is not what I would say the most well-recognized or uh, welcomed in the community. I, I, I can't see, say that too many people are citing this work and, and, and considering it credible. Science uh, has become so wide nowadays that there is uh, nobody in the world who can understand all aspects of it. Now, when an outsider like me tries to sort of encroach uh, on their turf, people react differently. One objection to Riskin's theory is that the open ocean can't keep methane bottled up enough to reach explosive proportions. You can't build up a lot of methane in the water because eventually you have so much methane that it can diffuse out. It can leak out before it ever gets too high in deep waters. Riskin believes methane production at ocean bottom outpaces diffusion in deep, still waters. But another problem is the need for a large ocean region stagnant enough to allow methane to build up over time. Most people think that the oceans, that the overall ocean, the majority of the ocean, would never become that stagnant. Professor Riskin, however, is steadfast in his belief. I have almost no doubt that there is a stagnant basin somewhere where methane is accumulating as we speak. But I have no idea where it might be simply because the deep ocean is very little known. Another reason some scientists disagree with Riskin's theory is that its destructive firestorms come from methane clouds that stay low to the surface. But methane ordinarily floats away into the upper atmosphere. At the University of Michigan's hydrodynamics lab, Professor George Kling demonstrates the basic principles. He pumps methane into soap bubbles, which rise quickly, and then burn when touched by flame. But these bubbles rise because they contain pure methane. If you take pure methane, it's lighter than air, so it will rise, just like pure CO2 is heavier than air and it, and it will sink. But in an ocean eruption, gas is mixed with microscopic water droplets. Scientists call it a two-phase mixture. And when methane is mixed with water, it behaves differently than pure methane. Once the methane comes out, if it's truly pure methane with no impurities in it, it, it will start to rise. However, this gas water mixture increases the density of the methane to the point that it won't simply flow, flow away like a hot air balloon. Chances are it will be ignited fairly quickly in the atmosphere, and so you won't have to worry about it dissipating too much. But a fiery gas explosion is not the only hazard we could face from methane in the ocean. Methane is also hidden away in a mysterious material called hydrate. Part water, part gas, it looks like ice, but it burns. It holds more methane in the world's oceans than anyone ever imagined. And if it is ever released, it could turn the planet into a searing hothouse. Methane bubbles up from the ocean floor in many places around the world. Sites where plumes of gas bubbles appear are called methane seeps. These plumes may reach heights of hundreds of meters, but then they disappear because uh, methane uh, gradually dissolves in water. 
In some cases, the gas comes from the sedimentary microbes that Professor Gregory Riskin says may slowly generate enough gas for an oceanic eruption. In other cases, the methane comes from underground deposits associated with petroleum. This is the natural gas used for heating homes and cooking food. We usually have to drill deep into the earth to get it, but it sometimes leaks out from small cracks in the ocean floor. So we're going to head to Trilogy Seep, which is due south of Kolal Point. Okay. Dr. Ira Leifer studies methane seeps for the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is examining how much methane released from the sea floor stays dissolved in the ocean water and how much bubbles to the surface to be released into the air. These bubbles saturate the water, kind of like your Coca-Cola, and the methane can't go into the water anymore after a while because there's so much methane in the water. Here, the shallow waters and active currents allow the methane to bubble out, instead of being trapped under pressure. Methane's buoyant, so it rises very rapidly. And right now, there are, one could say, an invisible smokestack of methane that's rising up into the sky above us. As his boat floats over the sea, Leifer keeps a careful watch on just how concentrated the methane around him is. We're measuring about four ppm, four parts per million methane in the air around here, which is about twice background because there's a lot of seepage, but pretty low. Now we're over in air with more bubbles. We're up to six and seven, up to 10. Okay, up to 20, 30, 50, up to 55 ppm. In just minutes, the measurement jumps from 55 parts per million to 5,000 parts per million. Still, there would have to be eight times more for the flammable gas to pose a danger. One reaches the lower explosive level for methane at 4%, which is 40,000 ppm parts per million. In the plume that we've been looking at today right here, the methane levels are not high enough to be ignited. However, when puffs of methane comes up, we do reach the lower explosive level. In such a situation, if you're smoking a cigarette, you'd be okay, but don't light another one. Bubbling seeps of methane gas may also come from an unusual material called methane hydrate, a little known substance that forms in ocean depths below 500 meters, which is 1,600 feet. Methane hydrate is a frozen form of ice in which methane gas is trapped in the ice matrix. Hydrate starts with methane gas dissolved in seawater. When the water freezes, it creates a rigid cage of ice molecules around each methane molecule. The process takes place only at the low temperature and high pressure of the deep oceans. The result looks a lot like normal ice, but if you put a flame to it, it burns. Hydrate could be an immense source of natural gas for the future. Natural gas is normally pumped out of pockets deep underground, and the supply is limited. But vast deposits of methane hydrates are buried in coastal ocean sediments. The amount of methane trapped in hydrates may be far more than is known to exist in the ground. It's estimated that the total methane available in the ground in the United States at the rate we're using it is about a 70-year supply. If we could harness all of the methane in hydrates in the continental U.S. waters, we would have a 3,000-year supply of methane. It's a vast quantity of methane. So this is of great interest. This is also of great concern because we must be careful that in the process of extracting this methane for use, we don't accidentally release it into the environment and create a catastrophe larger than we're trying to prevent. The existence of methane hydrate in the world's oceans is another reason why Professor Riskin's eruption theory is unpopular with other scientists. Here's why. Down to 500 meters below the ocean surface, methane dissolves in water. 
but not in concentrations enough to erupt in violent gas fountains, as the theory predicts. But below the 500 meter level, something happens. The methane no longer dissolves in the water, but turns into solid hydrate instead. For an eruption to happen, methane has to be dissolved in water, like CO2 in the champagne bottle. If the methane turns to hydrate instead, it stays locked up in its ice cage, and an eruption may not be possible. We cannot get too much methane into, into water before you precipitate hydrate, this solid phase. It's very, very difficult to conceive a notion where we have supersaturated conditions in the water because we can't do that today in the lab or in the modern ocean. Hydrates form at the low temperature and high pressure of the deep ocean, according to the laws of thermodynamics. But Professor Riskin believes there is more to the story. Thermodynamics is a very tricky science. Thermodynamics does not tell us how long it might take for the dissolved methane in the ocean water to precipitate uh, as methane hydrate. And according to some calculations, uh, it would take longer than uh, the age of the Earth. Although hydrates float just like regular ice, they typically stay deep underwater, trapped in seafloor sediments where they lock up much of the ocean's methane. But an earthquake or underwater landslide could release the hydrates. And if that happens, methane can escape in massive quantities. And if you don't maintain them at high pressure and low temperature, they suddenly turn into gas, potentially explosively. Gas escaping from methane hydrates may look something like this the molecular ice cage breaks down, releasing pure methane gas into the water. If large amounts of methane hydrate are shaken loose from their sediments, gas could escape in dangerous amounts. If a large amount is released and dissociated at the 500 meter level, then uh, that part of the water containing a lot of gas would be able to erupt, similar to a lake eruption process. Even if the process is not a series of violent fountains, as in Lake Nyos or Riskin's ocean eruption, large volumes of methane suddenly released into the atmosphere pose a different danger. A catastrophic methane release from ocean hydrates could kick global warming into overdrive. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. In fact, it's 25 times more potent than CO2 on a molecule by molecule basis. As a greenhouse gas, methane can make temperatures go up on a worldwide basis. In fact, there's now evidence that methane may have caused the worst planetary heat wave in Earth's history. It was extreme warming and it was global. It wasn't the mass extinction 250 million years in the past. Instead, it was far more recent. 55 million years ago, a massive methane release kicked up the Earth's temperature. The sudden change in climate turned evolution on its head and set the stage for the arrival of mankind. In 2001, NASA scientists used computer simulations of Earth's ancient past to look at the role of methane as a greenhouse gas in changing the prehistoric climate. They suggested that movement of Earth's tectonic plates caused a large-scale release of methane from the ocean floor. Unlike the sudden disaster that may have caused the Permian mass extinction 250 million years ago, methane may have been released over hundreds or a few thousand years and caused global temperatures to skyrocket. It took place 10 million years after the disappearance of the dinosaurs, as the Paleocene epoch was ending and the Eocene was beginning. It was a time of sudden climate change, now called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. The PETM is a period of extreme and abrupt global warming that happened about 55 million years ago, where the Earth warmed by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit at least, 
in a period of only about 10,000 years. So that's geologically very rapid. The methane that caused the temperature spike disappeared long ago. But scientists believe it was there because it left behind evidence in the form of carbon. Besides four atoms of hydrogen, each methane molecule has at its center a single atom of carbon. In methane, the central atom is carbon-12, which scientists call light carbon. But that element has another stable form called carbon-13, also known as heavy carbon. When paleontologists examined the ancient sediments from the PETM, they found much more light carbon than the environment normally has. The increase in light carbon, they suspect, came from methane. Methane has drawn increasing amounts of interest lately because it contains very light carbon. Uh, and when people look at sediments, they find this light carbon signature. The simplest interpretation is an enormous amount of carbon that was enriched in 12 carbon entered the ocean and atmosphere. The explanation I favor is that it's methane coming out of the bottom of the ocean. It's this large reservoir of carbon that is sensitive to pressure and temperature changes. The large reservoir of methane was locked up in the frozen methane hydrates that were buried in the sea floor, just as they are today. But just what happened to unlock them is uncertain. This is what the world looked like at the juncture of the Paleocene and Eocene epochs. The continents look familiar, but Earth's tectonic plates had them on the move. India, for instance, was in the process of smashing into Asia to form the Himalayan mountains. The ocean floor was uplifted in these movements, and this is what the NASA scientists suggest may have shaken loose methane hydrates, releasing methane as gas. Sometimes these changes trigger either uplift of big areas or especially trigger changes in ocean circulation. And uh, either one would warm and destabilize seabed methane. The methane would have bubbled out of the hydrates and reached the atmosphere, where it would gradually break down to form carbon dioxide. Methane and carbon dioxide are both powerful greenhouse gases. They elevate the temperature. That further destabilizes more of the methane. And pretty soon, you have a runaway process going until you've exhausted the methane that's built up. The worldwide temperature boost changed the face of the planet. If you were to come to Earth during the PETM 55 million years ago, you would find that in Wyoming, rather than having very dry and arid conditions, you would have vegetation that was more similar to what you find in Panama today. Um, subtropical forests, very lush. This is the time where horses and primates, our ancestors, and several other groups of modern mammals first appeared. The warming Earth sent evolution into a new direction, one that would produce new species, leading directly to the ascent of man. Thick forests extended into the Arctic, and strange dwarfed animals flourished. But environmental change at the Paleocene-Eocene transition had its losers as well. We come into the Paleocene-Eocene boundary and the bottom of the ocean, and it's a mass extinction. Many of the organisms go extinct, and that's it for them. Warming of the scale seen in the PETM would be considered a global catastrophe if it happened today. But if Gregory Riskin's theory is correct, and the methane release comes from the sudden explosive eruption of a stagnant ocean basin, the disaster would be swift and far more violent. It's a huge fountain, and a huge amount of methane would be expelled from the ocean uh, through those fountains. Few scientists agree that a global scale eruption in the open ocean is likely. But there are other bodies of water where the phenomenon may occur on a smaller scale. The Black Sea, for instance, is being studied today for its methane content. The Black Sea is essentially a stagnant basin. Since Black Sea is accumulating methane right now as we speak, 
it's easy to guess that it was doing it a uh, long time before, and uh, perhaps it was doing it for, say, a uh, few hundred thousand years. In fact, some scientists believe a deluge 7,000 years ago in the Black Sea gave rise to the Bible's account of Noah's flood. Professor Riskin describes the night he found a parallel to his methane theory in the book of Genesis itself. I went back home and uh, found the place, Genesis uh, 7, 11, and uh, I read the sentence which says, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And I was amazed because that's exactly the picture which I have for my uh, uh, methane-driven eruption. Methane concentrations in the Black Sea today are nowhere near enough for another eruption soon. More likely, according to Professor Riskin, is an eruption on a similar scale, perhaps an area the size of California. But it would happen somewhere in the open ocean, where the deepest waters are twice as deep as the Black Sea. That means the water under higher pressure could store even more methane, holding the potential for a global disaster. The long history of life on Earth is separated into periods, epochs, and other divisions, each marking an extinction or other change in evolution. The smallest of the divisions is the geologic stage, and the boundary between every stage is a target for the methane eruption theory of Gregory Riskin. I think that every single stage boundary, which is marked by a large or small mass extinction, is actually a result of a catastrophic event. And uh, I think that this catastrophic event is a methane-driven oceanic eruption because there is no other simple mechanism on the Earth which would uh, lead to this kind of repetitive wiping out of most of the life on the whole planet. Over the last half billion years, there are about a, a mass extinction every one or two or few million years. The last oceanic eruption probably happened about 800,000 years ago, which means that we may be overdue. And so we don't know whether it should happen tomorrow, or 1,000 years from now, or 5,000 years from now, we don't know. We also don't know where it could happen. Other scientists agree with Riskin that our ocean bottoms are not well known. So if a stagnant methane-bearing basin is out there, it has not been identified. The entire seafloor has not been very well explored. We don't understand all the processes that occur down there by far, and research is difficult, expensive, and has not been receiving proper funding. Without knowing where there are stagnant basins on the ocean bottom, the site of the next eruption, should it occur, could be anywhere. A methane eruption in the Pacific, for instance, could put the entire west coast of the United States in danger. It would begin in the deepest part of the ocean, as water saturated with methane may be shaken by an earthquake. Once the gas begins bubbling out, there would be a chain reaction, forcing fountains of methane and water to the surface across an area the size of California. This gas-water mixture, which is produced by the fountains, would be rolling away from the place in all directions uh, on top of the surface of the ocean. It would be rolling with a great speed so tsunamis would reach the west coast of the United States, for example, and say Hawaii, in a very short time, uh, perhaps a few hours. 2004's Indonesian disaster raised tsunami consciousness on the west coast. North of San Diego, the city of Encinitas has tsunami warning signs posted near the beach even though the risk here is considered moderate. 
But that's because most tsunamis are caused by earthquakes. This one would be very different. Well, the tsunamis would not just be a one-shot thing as they usually are. They would be coming on uh, continuously, days or maybe weeks. A small-scale simulation in a tank at the University of Michigan's hydrodynamics lab illustrates the tsunami effects of the continuous methane fountains. Instead of one or two waves generated by an earthquake, the methane fountains would send wave after wave against vulnerable coastlines for as long as the eruptions last. Cascading tsunamis from a Pacific eruption may first strike American shores at San Diego. The low-lying terrain exposes heavily developed areas to extensive water damage. It is possible to estimate that the flood waters may reach heights of over 100 meters in a large eruption. At that height, tsunamis would cover downtown San Diego leaving only the city's 25 tallest skyscrapers visible above the water. The tsunamis would hit other exposed cities as well, where whole populations would face the sudden disaster. In time, the entire world would be affected, as methane bubbles make ocean volumes expand to push up sea levels around the globe. The total sea level on the globe will increase by about 35, 40 meters. The methane in the water will take months to bubble out completely, keeping sea levels as much as 130 feet above normal. The world's coastlines would be visibly altered as the oceans push inland, flooding wide areas of densely populated cities. In scenes reminiscent of Hurricane Katrina, millions of people who survived the tsunamis would be driven from their homes along every coastline in the world. About 25% of the population of the Earth lives in the coastal area within 100 meter elevation from the sea level. So 25% of the population of the Earth would really be, could be affected uh, by an eruption like that just from tsunamis and the floods. But floods and tsunamis are only a beginning. Next would come the methane-bearing water clouds, ready to ignite as soon as they meet any random spark. Firestorms of methane would follow the tsunamis to all the West Coast cities and any place else on Earth where air currents carry the volatile methane clouds. I estimated that even in a reasonably small oceanic eruption, this explosive mixture will be able to cover the whole surface of the Earth with a layer of about 50 meter thick. The methane eruption itself is confined to one area of the ocean but the disaster it produces would be global. Though billions of people could perish, mankind may escape utter extinction. I'm confident that a large part of the population of the Earth will survive, but the damage uh, will be of a scale which has not been observed ever. The scenario drawn by Professor Riskin is almost too extreme to contemplate. Although few scientists agree with him completely, some are keeping an open mind. The mechanism that he proposed may not be correct. And so there are some details that may not be correct. The main hypothesis is still a good one, a very plausible one. A theory that predicts disastrous methane eruptions on a regular basis may seem improbable. And if only a few find it plausible, does that make it worth serious consideration? Even if there is a small chance that such a thing uh, will occur, the consequences of it are so disastrous that it certainly deserves funding on all levels. Only the global nuclear war, perhaps, compares. 
Even if global catastrophes are rare, ours is a planet where we know such disasters have occurred in the past. With that as their motivation, scientists worldwide will continue to search for clues to understand why they happened, hoping they may learn how we can survive the disasters of the future. The big melt is on. Mountain glaciers are shrinking in the Himalayas, the Andes, the Alps, and in North America. We only have 27 glaciers left out of the original 150 that were estimated to be here. And scientists say the ominous picture doesn't end here. The climate is literally spinning out of control. Melting glaciers will lead to rising oceans and killer storms. And like the mythical Atlantis, American cities could be swallowed by the sea. The Jefferson Memorial will be under 15 feet of water. I mean, water will go up to the outskirts of the White House. Glacier meltdown on mega disasters. Each day, 500 million metric tons of ice from the polar ice sheet are lost, perhaps forever. This alarms scientists because ice sheets cover nearly one-tenth of the Earth's land and contain 75% of the planet's fresh water. The potential melting from the big ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, those are really the gorillas in the woodshed if you want to talk about problems, far bigger than what we would get from a few glaciers melting. That's really a key for civilization in this century. What's gonna to happen to the ice sheets? The same ominous phenomenon is taking place all over the world. The renowned snows of Mount Kilimanjaro are disappearing. The frozen currents of the Andes are drying up. And the glaciers in Montana's Glacier National Park are vanishing. This full-blown retreat of glaciers is the result of an overall warming trend across the globe. The world's oceans are heating up. They've warmed very convincingly in the last 10 years. The climate system is changing, and it's changing at a rate that, compared to previous decades and centuries, is quite rapid. And warmer seas mean rising sea levels. As water warms, it expands. So warmer water actually uh, takes up more volume and increases the sea level as well. Scientists are predicting a rise in sea level of one, two, or even three feet by the end of the century. But if a significant portion of the polar ice caps melts, it could be much more. It's not totally unrealistic. Uh, to think that sea level rise could be maybe up to 10 feet between now and 2100. There's a lot of ice in West Antarctica. It's grounded below sea level, and it's inherently unstable. So we are concerned that it could slip away very rapidly. And this alone could raise sea level by 15 feet. Low-lying coastal areas could be devastated. Entire island nations in the South Pacific could be swallowed by the sea. In Bangladesh, the rice paddies that feed millions of people could disappear under salt water. Untold numbers of these people could be displaced and become climate refugees. And some of America's great cities, Miami, Baltimore, New York, and Boston, may see their most expensive waterfront properties washed away. Even worse, warmer oceans will cause more intense tropical storms and hurricanes. A hurricane is a, a heat engine. It's a monster that devours heat, and it gets it from the upper layers of the ocean. And so the warmer the ocean, the more heat for the hurricane to develop. Melting glaciers could be the first sign of this impending environmental catastrophe. 
A glacier is a slow-moving river of frozen water, a tremendous accumulation of snow compacted by the pressure of its weight and turned to ice. It oozes very, very slowly under the weight of its own gravity, and that's the key. A glacier has to move in order to be called a glacier. Some of these frozen rivers of ice move as fast as two miles per hour. During the last ice age, they carved entire landscapes out of rock. A glacial system may be as large as a continent or as small as a tiny valley between mountains. Each year when the snow falls, new ice is added. A healthy glacier is one that's getting plenty of winter snowpack and is not melting too much in the summer. Then it can maintain its mass uh, or can even grow. These mountain glaciers have been here for more than 10,000 years. Today, scientists are monitoring their health on a day-to-day -day basis. They predict that every one of these glaciers will be gone by the year 2050. But the lifespan of mountain glaciers is short compared to the rivers of ice that flow off the polar ice sheets. Many of these are more than 500,000 years old. It is these polar glaciers that are even more crucial to the future of the planet. Just in terms of mass, the polar ice caps are astounding. Antarctic is not at the human scale, it's, it's huge. If you actually want to count all the individual glaciers in Antarctica, you're talking about tens of thousands of glaciers. Difficult to get to, Antarctica, the seventh continent, was not even discovered until the 18th century. Since then, explorers and scientists have been trying to gather information about the polar ice sheets. In particular, they want to know how quickly the ice caps are melting, because this information can tell us how fast and how much the world's sea levels will rise. But the polar regions have remained elusive. You have to realize that uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, we didn't even know where all the glaciers were, the important glaciers. For decades, Greenland and Antarctica proved to be too huge to accurately survey. What we relied on was putting together hundreds or thousands of individual measurements taken in the field by individual scientists going and visiting a polar ice cap and taking samples. The complete picture of the polar regions and all their glaciers has remained an enormous jigsaw puzzle. There is no way from field work alone you could say anything about the entire sheet with, with certainty and with precision. Now scientists say seeing the ice sheets in their entirety may be a matter of survival for future generations. We really need to look at all of them, detect the areas where the changes are taking place, and keep an open mind that it may not just be one or two glaciers that are changing, but it could be a whole coastal range of several thousand kilometers which is changing at the same time. These changes in the polar ice sheets and glaciers could spell disaster. And what these scientists discover could have a life or death impact on millions of people around the world. As the world's glaciers melt, the area of white reflective surface shrinks, replaced by earth or ocean, both dark surfaces that absorb more heat, which in turn accelerates meltdown. This is what scientists call a feedback effect. In the last three decades, one third of all the glaciers in Glacier National Park in Montana have melted away. Since the uh, 70s, we've had pretty much a very rapid and full-scale disappearance of the glaciers. Ecologist Dan Fagri has been monitoring their demise for 15 years. Well, we use several ways of monitoring the glaciers. The first and most obvious one is that we take pictures. 
And these can be pictures from a point in the landscape, so you're looking at it from the side, and you can just look at the visual changes year by year. Sequential photos taken decades apart show how specific glaciers have shrunk in size. I can see with my own eyes how much that glacier has disappeared. And it's a little bit of a compelling and alarming kind of view because you think about glaciers as being uh, you know, a steady presence on a landscape. And to see it disappearing this quickly means that we are going through some very, very dynamic times. Here, Fagri is photographing Salamander Glacier, which has been losing mass rapidly. For glaciologists, the surface area is not the only factor that's important in determining a glacier's health. It's also how thick it is or how much total mass. And for that, we do a lot of ground measurements as well. And we can go on the glacier with uh, global positioning systems and get both the area and the height. In this 1850 image, you see the glaciers covering most of the scene here. And uh, the difference between 1850 and the present is that about 83% of the ice has disappeared. The prognosis for Glacier National Park is dire. Based on the best measurements that we have to date, it looks like the year 2030 is when most of the glaciers, if not all the glaciers, will be completely gone. A similar fate is predicted for glaciers all over the world. Almost all of the world's alpine, mountain, or valley glaciers have been receding. What's happening in Glacier National Park is basically going on globally. We're seeing that these mountains are being transformed by climate changes. Melting glaciers have long posed a threat to local communities. Like many high mountain areas, the glaciers of Peru were once feared for the avalanches they unleashed. You can have the situation where collapsing ice from a glacier will mix with volcanic material and creates a kind of a slurry. This is like liquid concrete moving at very high speeds. It's very, very devastating. And in certain spectacular situations, has killed a number of people. But now, melting ice has created a new kind of hazard. In the last three decades, the Peruvian glaciers have lost more than a quarter of their area. At some sites, ice has turned to water, forming high alpine lakes that threaten the villages below. The glaciers actually have a dam that they have created, and as they melt, they fill up behind that dam. And when the lake builds up to a certain level, it can burst out. In mountain regions, glaciers serve as vital reservoirs for fresh water, providing 50% of the water nearby populations need. When mountain glaciers disappear, there can be some real direct consequences for human beings. Case in point is some of these valleys in the Himalayas. It is the glaciers, particularly at the end of the dry season, they're providing the drinking water for people. So when those glaciers disappear, those people will have to find alternate uh, water supplies or basically have to move. In the Western United States, our dependence on glacial ice and snow reservoirs is just as great. It's about 87% of the water that Americans in the West have to use. So mountains are very, very critical in providing that water. A reduction in drinking water is only one of the problems caused by melting glaciers. Equally as troubling is what a meltdown of ice in the polar regions will do to sea levels worldwide. And the melting is occurring faster than anyone predicted. In 2000, scientists were stunned by changes at Antarctica's Ross Ice Shelf. The ice shelves act as buttresses for the glaciers, holding them back from the sea. Over the course of two weeks, a 4,247 square mile fragment, an area the size of the island of Jamaica, shattered and separated from the continent. Three trillion tons of ice, the world's largest recorded iceberg, drifted out to sea. This recent loss of glaciers and polar ice is an ominous indicator of how quickly the oceans are warming up. We're talking about several degrees warming over the next century, which is a huge number. 
the ocean is playing a very important role and today we just don't have a good idea what's going on in the ocean. But it's difficult to determine how fast the glaciers are melting. The one major difficulty we have, the flow of glaciers is mostly controlled by what's happening at the bottom. And the bottom is the part that we don't see. The changes that we're observing in the ice sheets are more rapid and larger than what is predicted by models. I think in the most extreme case, a lot of Greenland would be removed and a lot of West Antarctica. Then you could raise sea level 10 times more than that, 30 feet. A 30-foot rise means that many low-lying areas, such as large portions of Florida, would be submerged. Today, satellites are the most important tool that scientists have for monitoring what's happening to the oceans and the ice sheets. To see the whole ocean, you have to do it from far away, and you really have to do it from space. The satellites are able to do this, of course, because they're observing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, for years at a time. During the last 50 years, several different satellite systems have transmitted invaluable data back to Earth. In 2002, NASA, partnered with the German Space Agency, launched a pair of satellites to help determine the extent of glacier loss. The Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, called GRACE, measures the gravitational pull of Antarctica and Greenland. We took advantage of the fact that the same thing that, that makes you weigh on the bathroom scale, your mass, also causes a gravitational attraction that tugs on satellites in orbit. We wanted to, to put a bathroom scale underneath the ice sheets and actually weigh the ice sheets. Grace relies on two satellites, nicknamed Tom and Jerry. And they chase each other around and around the Earth, about 100 to 150 miles apart, constantly measuring the changes in their orbit down to the level of a size smaller than a red blood cell. These minute variations in Tom and Jerry's orbits alert scientists to changes in the distribution of water that covers the planet, whether in the seas and oceans, or in the form of ice in glaciers and polar ice caps. For five years, the satellites have been passing over the world's oceans and ice sheets, racking up a gigantic set of data. Every month, GRACE generates a new map of the ice that covers the Earth's surface. If you look at what's the biggest change over the five years of the GRACE mission, you really see that changes in polar ice are the things that really stand out. According to images generated by GRACE, the picture is clear. The ice caps are losing weight, while the oceans are gaining weight. Scientists estimate from 100 to 200 billion metric tons of ice melt away every year. For those who study these satellite signals, it's an alarming picture. Rising oceans will swallow farmland, towns, and cities. But unlike floods of the past, once the waters have been unleashed, they will not recede. Rising global temperatures are causing a meltdown of the Earth's glaciers and ice sheets. If a sizable portion of the ice caps melts, the result could be catastrophic. The big gorillas are Greenland and Antarctica. There's enough ice in Greenland um, to raise sea level by another 15 to 20 feet. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. More than one quarter of the Earth's population lives within 100 miles of a coastline. In the last two decades, many of these people have witnessed alarming changes. Once home to flourishing communities, low-lying lands are being eaten away by the sea. On islands in the South Pacific, residents have been fighting the encroachment of waves devouring their shorelines. Tuvalu, an island nation 3,000 miles from Australia, is only six feet above sea level. 
with the seas rising as much as three feet by 2100, Tuvalu is in danger of being swallowed whole. In 2001, some of the leaders of Tuvalu conceded defeat in their battle with the rising sea and petitioned New Zealand to accept the island's 11,000 residents as refugees. Each year, a handful of Tuvalans leaves, but others are staying put, wanting to call attention to the plight of their homeland. In Bangladesh, home to 150 million people, salt water from the rising ocean has invaded the freshwater rice paddies. Farmers have adapted by converting their rice plots into shrimp farms. But ecologists say that salt water has seeped into the drinking water. Without fresh water and rice to sustain them, it's possible that as many as 30 million climate refugees could be forced to find new homes outside of Bangladesh. In developing nations, this kind of mass dislocation could create havoc. When mass populations like this move and the areas they live in are untenable, it could create health problems on a significant level. All these have security implications. Retired Marine General Anthony Zinni has co-authored a report on the potential threat to national security posed by climate change. We could lose access to resources in existing places that we depend on now, and uh, that may create economic problems, and all this can generate conflict or, or challenge security interests we have, and therefore have a direct impact on the military. Human beings don't like to migrate. They don't like to move their families and their lives across big pieces of territory. Put that in a world or a country that doesn't have resources, doesn't have transportation, doesn't have a federal emergency management association. It's a huge problem. Climate-induced migration could turn out to be one of the major sort of health security issues of the 21st century. Disturbing signs of warming are also occurring in the Arctic. In Alaska, areas of permafrost are thawing, releasing methane, a potent greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. This phenomenon further accelerates the melting. With Arctic seas warming, whales, walrus, and seals are changing their feeding and migration patterns, making it more difficult for native people to hunt them. And while a dwindling food supply threatens the livelihood of indigenous peoples, a rising sea threatens to swamp their land. And farther south, a swelling ocean has been eating away the American coastline. It's sort of a rule of thumb that if sea level comes up one foot, the impact will extend in to the coast about 100 feet. In places like the Gulf Coast, where the land is really flat, it can be 1,000 to one. Startling changes are apparent off the coast of southern Louisiana, where the land is very fragile. You can go to South Louisiana today, and the land is literally turning to water. Every day, 50 acres of land in South Louisiana turn to water. Every 10 months, an area of land the size of Manhattan turns to water. But in other regions, the rising sea level is compounded by a natural phenomenon called post-glacial rebound. During the last ice age, a massive sheet of ice covered parts of North America. As the ice receded, land that had been weighted down by ice began to literally rise. Neighboring regions began to fall. The phenomenon is still at work along Chesapeake Bay. The landmass that connects the Chesapeake Bay region and New England is like a giant seesaw. It's one piece of land. The land is naturally sinking a bit. By the end of the century, land subsidence alone in the Chesapeake Bay region will add almost half a foot to the relative sea level rise. This may not sound like much, but a one-foot rise could move the coastline at least 100 feet inland. Residents of Chesapeake Bay have already witnessed changes. Thirteen islands have disappeared, literally disappeared in the last hundred years. And the last inhabited island in Maryland's portion of the Chesapeake Bay is disappearing at an unbelievable rate. One longtime resident of the region is former Marine Donald Willie. Willie has watched as the sea swallows Hooper's Island, 
he is fighting to save the island's one remaining legacy, an historic cemetery. My family has been here since before the Revolutionary War. My goal here is to try to stop this erosion and protect this graveyard for as long as I can. Within a span of nine months, he's witnessed significant changes. Just since last June, there's been about 25 feet has washed away back here. For Willie, the cemetery is emblematic of so much that has changed in the landscape that he calls home. Gone are not only the homes of longtime residents, but also the protection that barrier islands once afforded this region. If we get a bad hurricane, all this work that I've done here is gonna go out in the bay and probably half of these graves as well. When a hurricane approaches the mainland, barrier islands act as natural speed bumps, slowing the force of a storm. Even if the uh, water rolls over the uh, barrier island in a, in a hurricane, a uh, considerable amount of the energy is dissipated as the uh, water passes through the trees and the vegetation. The waves are further slowed by wetlands. The water goes into literally billions and trillions of blades of grass, the friction of which disperse the water further so that by the time the surge gets to serious population centers of human beings, it's been dramatically reduced. But now, the barrier islands and wetlands are disappearing. Without the protection of wetlands and barrier islands, great coastal cities such as New York, Miami, and Baltimore will be helpless against the onslaught of rising seas and killer storms. As the climate heats up, ocean temperatures also rise, carrying us a step closer to disaster. It's pretty certain that storms will become more intense. And this is because as water warms, the fuel for hurricanes sort of becomes higher octane. So the warmer waters will create more violent storms. The greatest danger posed by hurricanes is from storm surges. In the United States, 90% of the people who've died in hurricanes have been killed by storm surges. When a storm surge is accompanied by a high tide, it can raise water levels 15 feet or more and reach a mile or more inland. Throughout history, inhabitants of low-lying coastal regions have developed various ways to protect themselves from storm surges. In Holland, where much of the coastal plain lies below sea level, residents engineered a remarkable system of dikes and levees to hold the North Sea at bay. Windmills functioned as pumps, keeping the countryside dry. The Dutch really perfected the technique of using levees in the Middle Ages and have subsequently just built upon and built upon the levee system. But sometimes a pounding sea overwhelmed even the strongest defenses. In February of 1953, gale force winds and exceptionally high tides breached the dikes. The flood came in the night without warning. Waves destroyed 300 Dutch farms, 3,000 homes, and left more than 1,800 people dead. In England, a rising sea has been threatening the city of London for nearly five decades. In 1984, engineers erected the Thames Barrier, a flood control structure on the Thames River downstream from London. This is sort of a temporary gate, that's a door that's shut uh, when this big dome of water starts to approach the city. It's open and closed 80 times since it was completed in the early 1980s. Before 1990, storm surges caused an average of two closings per year. Since 1990, the closings have jumped 100% to four per year. North American communities have also been vulnerable to storm surges. 
During the 20th century, 167 powerful hurricanes slammed against America's Gulf Coast and eastern seaboard. But of the six most powerful storms to strike America, three of them happened in a span of 52 days in the year 2005. Wilma, Rita, and Katrina. And experts warn that Katrina may be a harbinger of things to come. What's of concern as a disaster science specialist is that many communities are not taking the Katrina lesson to heart. And there's always that attitude, it won't happen to me. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the global warming partially responsible for these more severe storms was triggered during the Industrial Revolution in the mid-19th century. As factories began to burn fossil fuels, millions of additional tons of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas, were released into the atmosphere. CO2 is very effective at trapping the Earth's heat. Think of it as a blanket. You know, the CO2 uh, intercepts some of the outgoing radiation from the Earth and traps it and then re-radiates it back down at us. During the 20th century, the world's temperature increased by an average of 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit, much greater than in any of the previous nine centuries. The rise correlates with the increase in fossil fuels that are burned by industrialized nations each year. And this rise in atmospheric temperature is followed by a rise in ocean temperature. But how much and how quickly the ocean is warming has been difficult to measure. Just as scientists have found with the polar ice caps, obtaining accurate temperature measurements of an area as massive as an ocean presents a daunting challenge. Until recently, independent measurements taken by researchers sailing the ocean on ships were haphazard and couldn't provide a global picture. We've got a few gaps in the coverage up here. A new like international project known as Argo is now providing a more comprehensive view. The Argo project is designed to measure the physical state of the oceans. And by the physical state, I mean the vertical structure of temperature, salinity, and ocean current. To date, Nearly 3,000 Argo floats have been deployed throughout the world's oceans. We have enough now that we feel we can really observe the global ocean at, at the level that it needs to be seen. Argo data indicates that the oceans are warming at an alarmingly rapid rate. For low-lying coastal regions, this warming trend could be devastating. In the U.S., the Gulf Coast, and especially New Orleans, are at extreme risk. I think it's the most dangerous city in the world to live in. Katrina, too, is inevitable because we failed to learn even one lesson from that hurricane, and that is rebuild the levees, rebuild the wetlands and barrier islands, and stop global warming. We're not doing any of that. With an eye toward the future, scientists have attempted to predict what a three-foot rise in sea level would mean for some of our cities. To illustrate the impact that a hurricane might have, an engineering firm called Applied Science Associates has generated computer visualizations of a Category 2 storm. The U.S. Geological Survey supplied data on the elevation and topography of each city. The National Hurricane Center provided its sea, lake, and overland surges from hurricanes, or SLOSH, model results to determine the maximum storm surge elevation as it floods cities along the coast. Anybody who feels safe even watching New Orleans disappear as a viable city should not feel safe because your city could be next. In New York, a Category 2 storm could cause a 17-foot surge, flooding much of lower Manhattan, including Wall Street and Ground Zero. In Boston, such a storm could generate a 14-foot surge, submerging much of the historic North End and Financial District. And in Miami, just a three-foot surge would inundate Key Biscayne, South Beach, and Miami Beach. 
In addition to these great coastal cities, Washington, D.C. is also threatened. One of the best kept secrets of global warming is that the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., is extraordinarily vulnerable to changes in our climate, especially in terms of sea level rise and more intense hurricanes. Although Washington is nearly 100 miles from the coast, its unique topography puts it at risk. Once a marshland, parts of the tidal basin and mall are only six feet above sea level. But what makes the city even more susceptible to ocean storms is the Potomac River. The Potomac River is a wide flowing river that actually has tides because it's connected to the bay, which is connected to the ocean, which means that if you get one foot of sea level rise worldwide from the oceans, you get one foot of Potomac River rise in downtown DC. If you get three feet or 23 feet or 80 feet of ocean rise worldwide, you get that much in Washington, D.C. With temperatures rising in the mid-Atlantic, this entire region is at risk. Scientists say, well, we could get one to two to three feet more sea level rise this century. Then you're starting to look at some very serious impacts for the nation's capital. Surface temperatures above 82 degrees could turn Category 2 storms into Category 4 or 5 hurricanes. Physicist Ming Li has done a hypothetical calculation for what such an intense storm would mean for the region. His projections are based on the behavior of Isabel, a Category 2 hurricane that lashed the Chesapeake Bay in 2003. We have done a very preliminary calculation, uh, assuming that if the wind uh, stress would be double that was experienced during the Isabel, then the uh, storm surge that expected at Washington, D.C. would be five meters, at Baltimore would be four meters, would be uh, twice as high as you was recorded during Hurricane Isabel. In other words, a Category 4 hurricane would submerge low-lying areas of Washington under more than 15 feet of water. And as glacial melt increases, the global threat from storm surges increases. Each day, data sent by satellites adds to our understanding of the big picture. There are literally thousands of scientists hydrologists, oceanographers, glaciologists that are taking those maps of, of ice mass changes, of ocean circulation changes, and interpreting them. And of course, the most important question of all persists. What can we do to slow this ominous warming trend? And will we be able to respond in time to avert a global catastrophe? It's easy to dismiss it as a 20 or 30 year out problem, but there are certain things that if they're not done now, we will not be prepared. We're gonna lose the opportunity, for example, to mitigate against the effects or to prepare ourselves for the effects. These experts are pushing for more aggressive cuts in emissions of greenhouse gases. But even if we make the needed reductions, most greenhouse gases take a very long time to leave the atmosphere. During this time, the oceans will continue to warm. If we were to stabilize greenhouse gases today, right now as we speak, the ocean would continue to warm for probably at least 30 to 50 years, maybe longer. Warmer oceans and the rise in sea level caused by melting glaciers and polar ice could create a worldwide disaster. One day in the not so distant future, rising temperatures could propel us toward a mega disaster. The glaciers in Montana have vanished. The mountains in the Himalayas, the Andes, and the Alps are bare of ice. And we've lost 5% of the Greenland ice cap and 8% of the West Antarctica ice sheet. Average sea level worldwide has risen by three feet. Already, cataclysmic storms have battered several American cities. The loss of wetlands has made New Orleans defenseless against even the weakest storms and subject to persistent flooding. 
sections of Miami have been deemed too vulnerable to rebuild. Lower Manhattan is a sodden disaster zone. And a warmer Atlantic Ocean continues to breed severe tropical storms. In our hypothetical scenario, a hurricane is building over Cape Hatteras, heading for the Carolina mainland. The storm is a monster in the making. The wind shear is low, and the eye wall forms a nearly flawless cone of clouds, some 60,000 feet high. In the eye wall itself, winds whirl at 230 miles per hour, lashing the Cape Hatteras lighthouse. Further to the north, residents of the Chesapeake Bay region brace themselves for the worst. Well, the areas that are very vulnerable to being flooded are, of course, all the coastal cities right on the main part of the bay, Annapolis, uh, the upper part of the bay, Baltimore. Some residents have experienced a Category 2 hurricane, but before today, a Category 4 has not hit this region. If we have a, a Category 4, you have to square the, uh, the, the energy that goes into these things, so you'd have four times as much energy. Meteorologists warn that the hurricane will make landfall by early the next morning. At 4 a.m., the storm churns into the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay at high tide. It's got a lot of maneuvering room, and especially if it has a small eye, you're talking about a, a hurricane in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay that's behaving as if it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The surge, now a gigantic mound of water, curves up the western shore, wreaking havoc on the town of Havre de Grace. Nothing slowed it down. It's barreled right into the bay. No barrier islands, no wetlands. Waves are whipped into a frenzy, smashing everything in their path. Houses are broken and scattered like so many matchsticks. It would be probably your worst case scenario for doing the most damage as it went up the bay. The storm lingers near the city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Probably have quite a bit of wind activity that could drive the waves, so you'd have a lot of damage. Residents of Baltimore and Annapolis, Maryland's capital, are ordered to evacuate. People panic. Rising waters have erased long stretches of pavement. Only four exit routes remain intact. You would be following a massive evacuation over four bridges. I can't visualize that we'll ever be able to evacuate a huge number of people. At 9 a.m., the storm heads up the narrow estuary of the Potomac. It hits the main stem of the Potomac River, and the water is funneled into a narrow area, and it has nowhere to go but up. By now, in Virginia, parts of historic Alexandria are underwater. The surge builds. Washington is almost 100 miles upstream from the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, but it is still very vulnerable. It's going to cause the surge to be channeled into a narrow area, which will cause it to rise and, and cause it to move faster toward the city. By the time the storm reaches the city, it is a wall of water. That might give us as much as 15 or 16 feet at the uh, heads of these tributaries. Waves sweep over the runways at Reagan National Airport. National Airport is low lying. Uh, and parts of National Airport were, is reclaimed land. The whole airport is right at sea level right now. It's right at sea level. The surge pummels buildings on the National Mall. In the tidal basin, the water keeps rising. You're talking about a city that big parts of it are, are just don't have a lot of elevation. It's a city that has many, many portions of it that are extremely vulnerable. Water will go up to the outskirts of the White House. When the storm finally subsides, parts of Washington are sitting under 15 feet of toxic water. This image of the nation's capital is a symbol of what many of our great cities could become. Unless we put the brakes on fossil fuels soon, it's going to be a city below sea level, surrounded by levees, hit by bigger and bigger hurricanes. 
According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, this could be the future. Coastal cities on every continent at risk. Tens of millions of people displaced with dwindling supplies of fresh water and food. All potential victims of what many experts say could be a global glacier meltdown. 